That's exactly what I was just thinking. Short clip. Some I, like I may go and catch something on fire tonight or something. Kiki might kill. Kiki wants to kill. Something like that. <laughs> Kiki's all burned. That was very disturbing, to be honest. Ha- have you ever seen anything weirder than that in your life? No, actually, I haven't. Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. This shit is so weird. Ugh. I mean, other than, uh, what's her name from Pizzagate? That, uh... Oh, yeah, uh, forget her name. Abramovich? Yeah, her shit. Well, even then, like, this guy... (sighs) I'm guessing this isn't the only video. Like, he has more. No, there's multiple. Multiple that are just, like, just as weird. Man. But this was his first one. All right. Anyways, so why did we mention this made-up character in Eric? Well, a lot of people point to that Shay character and state that there are a lot of artistic similarities between his bizarre, campy videos, notably the use of masks and unconvincing prosthetics. Also, people point to the fact that he lived close to Chicago in Bloomington, Indiana. But with those facts, the question still remains, why would Eric want to do this? Well, many people speculate that it was originally for publicity. So Eric was a music artist in a punk band called the Blood Farmers, and he wanted exposure for his band's music videos. Eric thought it would be a good idea to hijack the broadcast signal and put on his band's music videos for the entire world to see. However, at the last minute, he decided to ditch the idea of broadcasting one of their videos out of fear that they would be identified and reverted instead to his own spontaneous performance. Now. You can't ask Eric about all this because in 2010 he passed away. So there's no real way of actually finding out. Yeah, and there were people who asked his bandmates, hey, do you think that Eric did this? And many of them were like, no, he didn't. But then you have people who claim that Eric told them that he did it. Not his bandmates, but other people in general. Which, do they have any proof? No. So... Yeah, it's kind of just a theory. I definitely don't think it was him. I don't, I really don't see the similarities. Okay, yeah, he wore a mannequin mask, but that looked nothing like the rubber mask of Max Headroom. Yeah, you're right. So let's go on to our next theory, which revolves around it being an inside job. So this theory is that a disgruntled employee who had a problem with the network decided to have a little fun with them. This employee decided to single out Chuck Swirsky, who was a WGN sports broadcaster. He called him a nerd and stated, yeah, I think I'm better than Chuck Swirsky. That only can make one think that it could have been someone beat out of the position maybe as a sports broadcaster and that they were a previous employee or a potential employee of the network and it was an inside job. Possibly which our next theory kind of goes with it being an inside job. Like there's more facts and stuff that kind of points at it being an inside job. So let's go into that one. All right. So the next theory comes from a user on Reddit who made a post around 11 years ago with the subject line that said, I believe I know who was behind the Max Henroom incident that occurred on Chicago TV in 1987. This user was a computer programmer from Chicago named Bowie J. Pog. He stated on the Reddit post that he was around the local hacking culture in the late 1980s and hung out with a lot of the local hackers in that area. Now, even though he was only 13 at the time, Bowie was able to get to know some of the older hackers and begin attending small gatherings where online friends would meet and socialize in real life. At one party in 1987, Bowie remembers meeting a small, peculiar man that he guesses was around the age of 30. He called him Jay, and this Jay fellow was socially uncomfortable and may have been autistic. Bowie stated that Jay was being looked after by his older brother, Kay, who lived with his girlfriend in an apartment 10 miles away from downtown Chicago. Bowie remembers going to their apartment one evening and seeing their home having a very little standing room due to the amount of computers and cables that they had running everywhere. Both of the brothers were very good hackers. Later that week, on November 22, 1987, around midday, Bowie was at a small gathering at Jay's apartment. 
three or four people were standing around Jay, and they were all smiling about something that Jay was referring to. And then Bowie heard the word big. The group then left and decided to go to a nearby Pizza Hut. While there, Bowie asked a few of them what they meant by big. That is when Kay leaned forward and told Bowie to watch Channel 11 later tonight. Later that night is when the Max Headroom incident occurred. However, Bowie stated that the connection didn't occur to him at the time since that remark that was said to him to watch Channel 11 later that night was one of the dozen of things that he had heard that day from them. Bowie then goes on to say in the Reddit thread that he honestly didn't put two and two together at the time, that it didn't even click in his head, that it might be Jay until I was an adult. And the more I thought about it, the more everything clicked. My question is, how the hell can you remember going to a Pizza Hut at the age of 13 and what was said? Uh, I don't really remember, like, specifics. I just remember specific things that occurred, like high event things. For an example, me throwing a rock up in the air and letting it fall down to the ground, and I just kept doing that. And my parents were like, don't do that. And I ended up throwing one up, and it <laughs> came down and hit the car windshield and put a giant crack in the windshield. Ooh. We ended up actually going to Pizza Hut that afternoon. And I had been saving up money for a trampoline for like, I don't know, two years. And my dad was pissed. And he was like, I'm taking your trampoline money to fix the uh, windshield. Hurt my feelings, man. Sounds about right. All right, so continuing on, that Reddit post that Bowie made 11 years ago, it ended up catching a bunch of attention, and Bowie started to do multiple interviews. Now, after that, things ended up getting quiet for a little while, until five years later. Bowie returned to Reddit and made another post updating everyone on the situation, because a lot of people were like, you should turn in J and K to the authorities. Of course, J and K wasn't their real names. That was just their name that uh, Bowie was using to kind of like cover up their identity. But he said he still knew their full names. So a lot of people was like, go turn them in. And he's like, I don't know. I think I'm just going to do my own investigation. He ended up uh, updating everybody in this post. So tell us about it, Dan. In this post, Bowie said that J and K have been excluded as suspects in the Max Headroom incident that his original theory was incorrect. Bowie also states that he got in contact with Rick Klein, who is the curator of the Museum of Classic Chicago Television. Together, the two of them examined the video audio end of things in more detail and interviewed folks connected with the local radio television broadcast industry in Chicago at that time. They also had a meeting with several engineers and technicians who were actively working for WBBM, WTTW, WGN, and other companies in the Chicago broadcasting community at that time. These individuals gave very detailed information, including specifics of what kind of locations, gear, physical access, and more importantly, what sort of station-specific knowledge would have been necessary in order to pull off the broadcast intrusions themselves. Bowie and Rick came to the conclusion that the possibility of this having been an outside job is basically zero. That all the things which needed to have been possessed by an outside amateur or amateurs, no matter how talented, simply did not exist in the wild in 1987. This and other information as well is what allowed us to free J and K as suspects with full confidence. Bowie also stated that Rick was still working on his theory that whoever did the Max incident had ties to the local Chicago broadcast community. So yeah, that is where it kind of tied back into our previous theory that it was an inside job, which that's what I would lean towards. Yeah, because I did hear or read a theory that they believe that it was an inside job and that it was someone like on a floor above them that actually hacked the broadcast and was broadcasting that, which I don't know why. It yeah. Like someone on a floor above, but. Well, I don't know if networks have like um beef with one another you know they have like network wars or something oh you're with wggw well i'm with wttf you haven't seen anchorman no i've never watched that really i've seen like clips of it here and there but i've never watched the movie 
Dev Network Wars, or